Yeah. All right. Thanks everybody for coming. We will get started with this month's three sec. And as always, we're going to go over the rules. First rule, don't be a dick. We're here to have fun and share our stories. Uh, some people, you know, are very um, observers or conscientious of coming up here and talking in front of an audience. So let's give them our respect. Um, by the same token, don't take yourself too seriously. We are here to share our stories and have fun and be a community. So um, there's, there's two sides to everything, right? If tonight is your first time at Cleve Sec, you have to come up here and uh, at least say your name and where you're from and maybe what you do. Uh, but also because we're trying to really get to know people outside of just their day jobs, we have one question usually for a first -time, our first timers to answer. And tonight's question is, what was the best movie casting decision in the last 10 years? But there are no repeats, so if someone says what you were thinking of, you have to think of something else. Um, I, as the first one to go, have the privilege of saying Heath Ledger for the role of the Joker. So if you're thinking of that, too bad. <laughs> think of something else. Where we live, we have our Twitter account as our main communication platform. Um, you can also use hashtag CleveSec to, uh, you know, throw tweets at the CleveSec community, and we will uh, usually be on top of that and retweet and uh, amplify your signal, so to speak. Our meetup page is where you can find information about our events and the descriptions of every um, talk and, and upcoming events and things like that, uh, locations for our community nights and so forth. We do have a LinkedIn group, not much goes on in there, it's kind of the obligatory LinkedIn group, uh, but if you want the little CleveSec logo on your LinkedIn profile, by all means. And finally, we have CleveSec at gmail.com is where you can reach us on a more uh, private channel if you don't want to uh, you know, tweet something or, um, or post something on Meetup, you can always email us with some sort of idea or suggestion or anything like that. Uh, the Meetup, by the way, also has uh, kind of like a forum page, so we can uh, post discussions and, and such other things in there. And YouTube is where we post our videos that we record. So I, I'll apologize right now that I haven't posted the previous meeting yet, because uh, I've been crazy busy. Uh, but I'll do everything at once, so when I do this meeting, I'll also do the previous meeting. This is a community effort, so thank you again for coming and, and sharing your, your stories and talking to everybody. The, um, if you don't already know, the second Tuesday of the month is when we have these meetings where it's more of a lecture format. People come on and um, talk about a specific information security topic, um, teach people things, and you know, sort of a lecture and discussion kind of format. Um, the last Tuesday of every month is our community night where we pretty much just get together to talk about whatever, have fun. Um, we usually have a pub night. It's not always a pub night, so if you have any ideas for something other than a pub night, we're always um, open for, uh, for that. Um, and lastly, because this is a community effort, we have uh, you know, some social media channels to spread the word, but uh, by far we found that if, if one of you tells someone else about CleveSec, uh, they will be interested and they'll come and they'll also share their story and, and get to know us and increase our community that way. So <clears throat> please do spread the word about CleveSec and let's uh, get the party started. Tonight's agenda, Dennis is going to talk about what it is to, what it's like to work at a pen test firm. Um, so that should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. And we will finish the night with an introduction to Kali Linux by Anthony who will um, tell us how to get past that first intimidating look of Kali and then get into all of the different tools that, as you probably know, apply to all levels of security testing. <coughs> that having been said, let's get our first timers up here. Come on up, please say your name. You can use the microphone if you'd like. And remember that we need a choice of who was the best casting choice for the last past 10 years. Can I just use the microphone? 
you know, I took it. I used my microphone because it was handed to me. Um, I, my name is Corey. I have a podcast for Hurricane with Dennis and Kelsey. And um, I would say the best casting decision is that guy from the laugh track on Big Bang Theory. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kelsey Clark. I am the digital marketing specialist of Hurricane Labs, and um, let's see, I don't know if this is the best, but I really liked Christian Bale in the pilot. Hello everyone, I'm Dennis Skillet. I'm a pen tester for Hurricane Lab. I'm the presenter also here at Gate Uh For, I don't think I've seen the movie in the past five years or something like that. Um, so I'm gonna say that whoever that guy was that was in the movie Pi, you guys know? That's the back guy. Hi, I'm Nick Salado. I'm a pen tester for uh, PNC Bank. Um, and I'm gonna have, I don't watch very many movies. I'm going to have to go outside for 10 years, but the best casting decision probably was uh, Russell Crowe as Jack Aubrey and Paul Bettany as Stephen Turner in uh, Master and Commander. Hello. <laughs> I got a loud voice, so I'll just talk to say you guys. My name's James Conn, and I'm uh, an IPG student. And uh, Mr. Godfrey's my teacher, and I'm just plus one for his tell people about <laughs> <laughs> And the best casting in the last 10 years is probably Mark Ralphio as the new Hulk in the Avengers movie over the uh, other guy. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Sam Moore. I, too, like James, am a student at ITT with uh, Mr. Godfrey as our teacher. Uh, my pick would have to be. Let's do Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Tom. I probably come from a background that other people don't have. I'm a college philosophy professor. Well, things with like 10 years in amateur sort of security stuff and trying to like move into working in security. Um, best casting choice, probably the guy from Inherent Vice. I always forget his name, he's in like 50 other movies. <laughs> Uh, name's Andy. Uh, I'm wrapping up my last year at Oakland College for a CS degree. Uh, and best casting decision. I would have to say the entire cast of Drive as all the characters of Drive. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Tony Godfrey. I'm a Linux bigot and Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, another round of applause for our first timers, please. All right. Uh, one quick announcement: we, we will have to swap the pres presentations because Anthony has to leave at seven. Uh, so we will have Linux first and uh, fun pen testing against each other. I guess <laughs> that's all right. Pretty much. Yeah. Cool. All right, so if you're done with your pizza, there's still more. You can go ahead and help yourself while we set up for the first stop. And I'll get something to eat too. <laughs> Thank you. Good, good, good. I wandered around an awful lot. It's hard to hit a moving target. So <laughs> thank you very much for coming out tonight. It's my first time here as well. Again, Scarlett Johansson, and I'm set. Anyway, um, my name is Tony Godfrey. Uh, I've got 25 years of networking experience. I'm an old Unix administrator, so therefore I went to the Linux side of the house. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> um, actually, I rewrote the Linux administration class for the company I presently work full, full time for, which is ITT Technical, which I have a couple of students and a past student here. Um, I have owned my own company. I've got 25 years of networking experience. I've had my own company for about 13 <coughs> years now. And basically, it's security auditing, it's turned into more training. Um, I did another show uh, concerning Kali Linux. Does anybody ever go to the ISS, Information System Security Summit, it's usually in the fall, right around Halloween? It's in Westlake, believe it or not. It's just down the road. Um, two to three days. It's business track, techie track. You guys are going Hurricane Labs in the fall. Yeah. They've been involved for years now, which is a good thing. Bill's a good guy. Yeah. Bill's a very good guy. And I uh, started my own company about 13 years ago and got into teaching, and things just kind of went from there. And it's been very rewarding. So, but let's talk about Cali Linux. Again, thank you very much. I like that screen in the one in the back wall. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
been doing stuff since 03 on my own. Uh, I also teach other things, including Linux, security, Cisco routers, cybercrime, and forensics. So, and as of yesterday, um, uh, what is it called? Step in Dean or whatever it is, temporary Dean. If you guys don't mind, instead of, I used to make a lot of copies of CDs, DVDs, things like that. If you guys want, uh, I've got a bunch of business cards. Email me. I'll send you a link to my Google Docs drive. And you'll get my presentation, labs, PowerPoints, uh, other PDFs and materials. Email me, I'll link you into it, download what you want. Also, if you take a look at my slides, because we always take the notes, and then what do we do with our notes? We lose them. So why not make notes and other additional materials part of the notes section of the slide? So if you find something that maybe is not quite clear, or you're looking for something else, take a look at the notes section. I probably put the link or other notes down there as well. I don't like to throw away stuff that you find. Um, last year I did a six hour training for the HTCIA, High Tech Crimes Investigation Association. We have a meeting every year down at Salt Fork Lodge, which is east of Columbus. Uh, there is an Ohio branch, Ohio HTCIA. You may want to take a look at it. Uh, they do a lot of things in the area. I did a six hour class. I did the intro part, which is what I'm going to do tonight. And then I did a lab, hands on kind of stuff. So instead of throwing that away, I actually kept that part of the slide deck. So download it. If you guys want to run some of the labs that I do, I've got step by step by step down below as well. So download this stuff, share it with people. Seriously. But use your powers for good. <laughs> Presentation intro. Let's talk about it. Who or what is Kelly? Well, the mother goddess, despite her fearful appearance, protects the good against the evil, unlike other Hindu deities. Or is pretty scary. Guys, she's blue. So, you've seen this picture. Uh, the picture that you normally see her with is a little bit more gruesome. It's usually she's standing over top of her husband and ripping out his heart. Because she wants him to stay put. But also, the protector of what's evil. Um, remember, it's also it's a deacon based Linux distribution. You guys remember offensive security, these couple of guys? They made something called Backtrack, which we all downloaded, we all put it on a flash drive. Um, I see you got a portable there. That's, um, do you guys remember the old the EE700s? I think it's a series before that. You loaded it on an SD card, you popped it in, you hit escape, booted it up, life is good. What do you want to do with it? It had all the built-in uh, video and uh, wireless drivers already built into it. You could probably buy one of those on eBay, the older ones, for maybe 30 bucks. Pop in an SD card, turn it on, you're set to go. What do you want to do? It's kind of like the reverb of Backtrack is what Cali is. It's a custom distro. Uh, largest collection of wireless hacking, server exploiting, web applications, social engineers, available all in a single Linux distribution. So the programmers, which is next, they decided to go ahead and take Backtrack off the shelf. Because think about it, how many times can you constantly update the same product? What are you doing? You're making it slow, you're making it sluggish, you're adding things on it that, and you're not taking anything away. So why not take it off the shelf, take a look at it, and hey, let's do it right. Have you guys played the back backtrack before? Do you find Cali a better product? I do too. Much better product. And it's darn bloody quick too. Which is nice. But again, the programmers took it off the shelf and said, well, penetration distribution should like life. They've taken all their knowledge, experience, and they've grown it. They've matured it. It's the next generation. And then all of a sudden, a little over two years ago, it came out. When we were all still looking for backtrack, how many of you guys downloaded Kali? Yep. This is a good thing. A lot of people, it's like, what is that? Developers would like everyone to use Kali, but please remember, Kali is not, uh, let's say, Ubuntu. You don't just pop it in and you don't go, right? It's got a lot of crazy tools and things, and it's like giving a three-year-old a fire hose. you got to watch what you do with this, so warning, warning. Uh, Kelly's also, um, they like its own dedicated hardware. It doesn't run bad on a virtual machine, but the problem that I have with virtual machines, sometimes you get a lot of false positives. Have you guys ever come across that? 
Good. Hardware is relatively inexpensive nowadays, right? The other nice thing, how many of you guys have heard of the Metasploit environment? Yes. Um, practice your craft in a controlled, safe environment. Don't go out and say, you know, I'm going to run all those Kali tools against, I don't know, CNN.com. Let's see what happens. Control what you need to do first. Actually, the Metasploit people have made something called Metasploitable, and they will walk you through the process of these are the things you should be looking for. Try this, do that, refine your craft first before we do what? Turn it loose in the wild. VMware 5 works well. Set it to a gig. More gig if you want. Kali recommends 10 gig for the initial install. Remember 512 meg of RAM? Anybody here remember what a 386 is? Hmm. Um, the other thing, has anybody heard of Veil? Veil is pure evil. And I love it. I do. I, I really love this application. Um, and don't forget your alpha antenna. How many of you guys have heard about an alpha antenna? A couple. Not a big deal. After tonight, you want to go out and buy one. The cool thing about this guy, just to give you an idea, I have an old laptop out in my garage. I use it basically for Pandora and looking up car parts. Um, I was averaging maybe 62, 63% of signal. Popped one of these guys on it, and I'm hitting 96%. And the thing about it, though, this is the, the little cheapy $25, $30 one. They've got ones with longer whips, one with more power. Those kind of things. It's got a USB cable in it um, that you'll you know pop into the bottom, pop into a USB port. The other nice thing about the Alpha antennas, um, you don't have to load any software. It comes with its own firmware. You actually plug it in. You wait. It comes up and says, "Hey, here I am," and go. So you'll find those on eBay, Amazon, wherever. Probably anywhere from twenty to forty dollars in that range. It's a slick little antenna. And again, it comes with its own firmware. It doesn't care if you plug it into an Apple, a Linux box, a Windows box. It just works once it starts blinking and you're done. <coughs> penetration, for, penetration testing refined. You've got the big blue dragon, which you can't see. And you can't see that one very much either. But it looks really cool when you're up close. Anyway. Scarlett Johansson. Anyway, next. <laughs> other guys. There are some other guys that were out there. Did you know about Backbox? It's also Ubuntu based. Why do you think a lot of these companies or developers take a look at Ubuntu, for instance? Familiar. Good, familiar. Ubuntu is based on which major distribution? Debian also. Debian also, right? And they come out with an update one. Maybe every couple of years. It's very, very stable. It's also very, very small, too. It takes a little tiny footprint. And I think it's probably really, really customizable. What's one of the other bigger distributions that have actually shrunk down a little bit that gives you some, let's say, some play that you can tweak it a little bit more? Have you guys taken a look in the last couple of years about anything that's Slackware based? Even the new version of Puppy is Slack, though. I like it because it's probably the most Unix like, which is what I'm used to. Provides minimal yet complete desktop, thanks to its own software repositories, always updated for stable versions every couple of years. Not bad. How about Pen2? Remember these guys? Live USB 3264-bit. That's got some cracking software. It's also not bad. How about Black Pen2? Going back to that Buntu thing, something that's Debian or Debian. Security training students, practitioners of information. It's not bad. Based on Ubuntu 10.10. Six one way, half a dozen the other. On guard? It's been out there for quite a while now, too. Students, security enthusiasts, those wishing to evaluate the level of security. It's not bad. Does anybody remember any of these? Novix. Mm -hmm. Novix. How many of us have an old copy of Navix? It's the System Administrator Toolkit, right? It has everything we ever wanted on it. 
Klaus Knopper is a genius, and he comes out with what flash drive, CD version, still DVD version. What do you want to do? And I think he still writes for one of the Linux rags too, Linux magazine maybe. Samurai weaker than. Remember when King was just an application? <laughs> And now it's starting to do what? It's starting to mature, it's starting to get bigger, but I think it's starting to become more forensic-y than it is attacking. And it's got that awful screenshot of that guy who used to be on the CSI on the show. <laughs> How many of you guys have downloaded and played with a copy of Deft? Deft is actually made primarily for forensics. Um, it's made by the Italian ball things. So it'll take you like three and a half days to download. I'm just kidding. It seems to take a long time to download. But Dept has an awful lot of forensics tools in it. It's got a lot of GUI based stuff. It's also got a lot of command line stuff in it too. Um, law enforcement also uses it as well. It's not a bad distribution. Um, one of the things that I'm working on now, um, how many of you guys have thought about cloud security? How many of you guys have thought about bringing stuff back from the dead if you deleted something from the cloud? Start out making your own cloud, in all honesty. Own cloud is really a nice piece of software. In fact, if you go to the VMware appliance site, you can download a pre-built appliance. Linux, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the uh, username is root passwords Linux. You got your own cloud. That's it, somebody's already done the hard work for you. You just have to set up user accounts and permissions. When you delete something from the cloud, it actually goes somewhere else. That's really kind of cool to see the back end of that. Uh, Depth is really good for that. So what's in the box panel? Top 10 security tools, information gathering, vulnerability analysis, web apps, password attacks, wireless attacks, exploitation tools, sniffing, spoofing, maintaining access, reverse engineering, stress, hardware forensics, reporting, system services. This program could definitely not be your friend if you mistreated it. The other nice thing that I do like about it, let's say it also comes with meta packages. Maybe I only need a certain tool set. Maybe I only want stuff that goes after passwords. Maybe I after some voice over IP stuff. Maybe just wireless. Maybe I just want the Cali Forensics tools. I can just download the tools that I need. I don't have to download the entire package. All depending on what, what my needs are, what I'm going to do. That's kind of cool. I can always add these tools back in later on if I wanted to. But maybe I just want to download what I need. Other information stuff. There's a lot of really good legitimate sites that are out there. Setting up a pen testing lab, a hacking tutorial. 20 things you want to do after installing Kali. Give yourself a little bit of time to install Kali, and then what's the first thing that you guys should do to any operating system? Patch, update, because you don't know how long that piece of software has been sitting on the shelf. Update, patch, cracking the web, six resources and tutorials on Kali. And again, if you guys click on these, once you download the PowerPoint, you'll also see them in the notes section as well. Click on it, take a look at where I'm going. Kali and more pen testing. There's a bunch of pen testing tools. There's actually a pen test magazine. Did you guys know that? It's available online. Pen test mag. What do you want to do? Did you guys know that you could use something as simple as a browser as a pen testing tool? If I'm going to go up against websites, why not use a modified web browser? The scary thing about it, somebody's already made one, a downloadable version for Firefox. It's already got all the tools built into it. What do I want to do today? It's kind of scary. Use your powers for good. In a controlled environment against something like a spoiler. Cali specific websites. Cali for hackers. Hacking with Cali Linux. There's something called the YouTubes. <laughs> Cali Linux, the regular site and hack with Cali Linux. Again, these are legitimate educational sites. These are not that I'm gonna go take down somebody else. How do we become better security practitioners? Number one, you understand the limitations of what? The operating system. You understand the limitations of what? 
the applications that you've got loaded on the operating system. Can I do anything against the hardware? Maybe. Thank you. Patch all the existing stuff first. How many of you guys work with somebody that thinks that security is a silver bullet and that our jobs are easy? Oh, we've got a firewall. One of my first security audits, I wandered into a customer's site and I asked him, I said, you know, what's your protection like? And he goes, we got a firewall. And I looked at it. And it's plugged in, but it's not connected to anything. It's blinking, though. So I guess when somebody came in, they were going to swing it around their head and hit somebody with it. I don't know. Or when's the last time it's ever been updated? When's the last time you actually did, what, a test against your system? Well, we installed stuff. Yeah, but did you test it? How many of you guys have heard the backup horror stories? Oh, we've got a backup done every night. Really? Did you try restoring anything? One of my first customers decided, hey, this is great, we back up stuff every night. But your script was one character off, so for the last six months, you backed up nothing. But you made the little wheels go around and the tapes go back and forth. Test, test, test. Do you ever find out in this field, guys, if you're really, really paranoid, you're probably really good in this field? <laughs> Think about it. Kelly Publications. Uh, has anybody heard of a publication called eForensics? Good. It's a really good glossy magazine PDF. Um, I think it's Northern Europe somewhere. Um, in fact, the version that I've got on the website and stuff, it's free to download. It's got, I think, about 110 pages in it. And they go through a lot of the basics, and then they walk you through, I think, half a dozen tools or so. It's really a well-written magazine. Basic security testing with Cali Linux. This should be on your tablet, on your cell phone. It's purchased through Amazon for less than $7. And know what's nice about it? It's a cookbook. What do I want to attack? What do I want to take a look at? If I understand the weaknesses of an OS piece of hardware application, now I know how to fix it. Right? Use your powers for sure. Basic security testing. It's a cookbook. Let's take a look at web. Let's take a look at WPA. Let's take a look at some of the other things out there. You guys think that web will ever get fixed? You think DNS will ever get fixed? Here you go. Here's another one for you. You ever think Dropbox will ever get fixed? Okay. <laughs> uh, the Kali Linux assuring security by penetration testing is more policy and procedure. But this basic security testing, take a look at that. It's on Amazon, digital format, downloaded tonight, for like seven bucks. Put it on your tablet, put it on your cell phone. It reads very, very quickly. And again, it's a well-written cookbook. Cali book, backtrack to Cali, basic security testing with Cali, and of course, assurance <coughs> security. How about running it on a tablet? Do you guys have an old tablet at home? Like an old Samsung 2? This is great. Yeah, you can go ahead and pop this guy on your tablet. So next time you're at Starbucks, why not? Let's see what everybody's doing. The cool thing about it, all you have to do, you gotta get a tablet, not mine. Install Linux Deploy from the Google Play. Samsung keys, because I got a Samsung tab too. Uh, USB debugging on. Install a super one click. You wait about five minutes and voila. There you go. It's an old tab too. I honestly think I spent more money on eBay looking for a case for the little keyboard so I could charge it <laughs> and go pop it open. Now you've got a dedicated tablet. And the cool thing about it, it's even got the virtual keyboard that pops up too if you don't have one. So I can type stuff. How about Nexus? They've got a distribution all made for you called Net. You just download it. You install it on a Nexus box. You're set to go. The cool thing about it, it'll run on the 10, it'll run on the 7, it'll even run on the phone. That's kind of scary too, isn't it? But of course, with any of these things, what are you going to do to your battery life? You've got to bring a charger. Because the back of the phone will get hot. Of course, you need the 802.11 stuff. 
It's also got a little pop up keyboard, full Cali tool set. What do you want to do? On a tablet, something that portable that you can put in your pocket. Because remember, this guy doesn't take that much juice to run. How many of you guys have heard of Lifehacker? Oh, go to Lifehacker. They have probably got the biggest distribution of information which you could do with a Raspberry Pi. That's all out there on the interwebs. Right around Halloween, they do their week of evil. And these are the good things that they talk about. That you can use Cali, Cali I'm sorry, for penetration testing. Who best knows your network than you do? I mean, if you're inside your network, you've got a lot of information, right? Take a look and see if that information is secure. Have Cali run in the background, take a look at your router, take a look at your other servers, your other computers. Take a look at your road. Well, here's something scary for you. How many of you guys have heard about Progressive? How many of you guys trust Flow? I don't trust Flow whatsoever. Because what Flow's not telling you, if you want to save money on your insurance, hey, let's take this totally unencrypted little guy and let's plug it in the OBD port. So that way, everybody can get into it and see what you want to do. Do you know that's highly insecure? State Farm's looking at that, too. And they even give you a power amplifier that you can click on your visor so you can get hacked that much quicker. So, that's kind of scary, too, isn't it? <laughs> I think we're all kind of scared one of these days. Um, Audi has taken a look at that maybe we should not have everything all in one computer system. Windows XP. How many lines of code do you think that was? 35 million lines of code, believe it or not. And then this nasty thing called Microsoft ME version 2, called Vista, was 50 million lines of code. And what's the first thing they wanted you to do? Buy more hardware. It's an OS. I mean, you can only crash Word and you know, Solitaire so many ways. A typical infotainment system in a car is 100 million lines of code. In a car, it's checking your brakes, your steering, your input. Is it slick out? Is it dry out? Hey, let's take a look at music. Let's take a look at this, this, and this. How about the GPS coordinates? Think of everything that your car is doing. Auto show over in Europe last year, BMW came out and said, you can connect six devices to our car. Audi found out the day before. They updated their software and says, you can connect seven to ours. <laughs> in your car. It's kind of scary, isn't it? How do you protect your car? You know what's going to happen. How much, how much many of us spend so much time in our car, right? <coughs> Take a look at that. How many of you guys have heard about a Raspberry Pi? Yes. How many of you guys have actually bought one? 35 bucks. Did you buy the new one or the old one? Eight bucks. Yes. I got an old one. It's cheap. <laughs> this guy has got a bunch of stuff built into it. The only thing you need is what? Cables, right? And an SD card. The new one, I think even when you put a micro SD card in, it doesn't even stick outside the case anymore, which is nice. Looks like this thing. This is blown up like 9 million times. SD card goes in, and again, the new one's got a micro SD card. Um, works on a mini 5 volt. They say one of the best ones to use, believe it or not, old guy like me, still uses Blackberry. <laughs> it's one of the best ones because it actually has the cleanest power going through it. So take a look at Blackberry. System chipset. It's got a couple of USB ports, Ethernet connection, and I think if uh, you go to a Kena kit, you can buy the whole kit, even the wireless keyboard and everything for like $60, $70. Kena kit. I'm also on the advisory committee for Max Hayes High School. This is something scary, guys. This coming in September, 9th and 10th graders, you're going to get a box of parts, Kena kits. It's going to come with everything minus monitor, of course. They want to show students, 9th and 10th graders, in less than an hour, you can put together your own computer, you can load an operating system, and you can start programming in Python. Go. Starting September. High school students are going to start getting those. That's pretty slick, isn't it? Code Academy, code.org. You guys can take a look at those sites, too. I like Code Academy. Little tiny guy. It's real, real slow. You can't overclock 
market, it does get hot, I would definitely recommend taking a look at the newer ones. It's still 35 bucks. Um, the other nice thing too, there's already a Kelly Dispro made out there for it. You can get to the SD card, pop it in, turn it on, life is good. What do you want to do? So what's Metasploit? Intentionally vulnerable Linux virtual machine can be used to conduct security training. Again, use your powers for good. Don't just download a distro of all the nasty ones that are out there and then just start wailing away at somebody else's website. Please don't do that. Um, if you guys send me your email, I will connect you to the books, the official guides, that e-forensics book, other publications that I'm allowed to give away, the Cali ISO. Um, how many of you guys in the Windows world know what rain meter is? That's kind of cool, isn't it? It makes things nice, it makes things different. On the Linux side of the house, there's a really good package too that's fully customizable called Conky. Take a look at that, C-O-N-K-Y. It's a basic Linux uh, top what things are doing, but you can also modify it to make it do all the way cool things that Rain Meter does. Conky is very customizable, and it works really well on uh, one three. I haven't tried it on 1.9 yet. The Metasploitable documentation, I think it's a couple hundred pages. SD formatter, UNet boot. I mean, these are all just six one way half a dozen, right? Some of you guys, you like one tool as compared. There's a lot of bicycles going on the back. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Unit boot, USB installer. I'm kind of partial to Win32 disk imager right now. I point it to an ISO, I pop in a flashy, I wait two minutes, three minutes, and I'm done. What do I want to do? What I do like about Unit button is even if it's on the Windows side of the house or it's on the Linux side of the house, the interface looks the same. You just click the shell script and you're done. It works really well. And of course, it's PowerPoint with all the other drives and uh, labs and things in it. I also kind of divided it up this way. I want you to type in something, might be a question, doing some reconnaissance, and of course, attack. But he's a vegetarian, remember. How many of you know what trace rod does? Why would you use it? What's that? Why not where it's supposed to go? Why not where it's supposed to go? Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Oh, man. It's, it's, it's. One of these days I'll get it fixed, right? <laughs> Trace swap displays the route path measuring transit delays of packets. Basically what I'm checking for. I'm checking for other pieces of hardware between point A and point B. Right? That has an IP address. Pretty much. In the Windows side of the world, it's Trace RT. Trace route spelled out in the Linux Unix side of the world. The Unix side. Let's take a look at what it does. Trace route, space dash I, the I means interface. In the Linux, in the X world, ETH0 points to which network card? The first Ethernet. The first Ethernet card. Thank you very much. Remember, this is all numbered in hexadecimal 0 through 9, 8 through F. 16 places. 16 divided by 2 is 8, right? Isn't the world based on eight if you think about it? Our world, 32 bit, 64 bit. If I said the number 1024, we all know what that is. The answer to the universe is not 42, it's eight. All I'm doing here is going up against my metasploitable environment. And basically it's one hop, one virtual machine to another. According to my router instructor, he worked at AT&T for 25 years, I should be able to hit anywhere in the world in less than 30 hops if I had efficient network. If I have over 30 hops, something's not right. How many of you guys have used Nmap? Yes. Security scanner used to deliver hosts and services. I'm going to check a look at port 0 through 65,535. On the IP address, I'll type that in, and then less. Basically displays what information a page at a time. Let's take a look at that. Metasploitable happens to have these services open. Do you guys recognize the port numbers? Do you recognize the services that go with the port numbers? Do you 
you also see the word open. That's kind of scary too, isn't it? So, smart people, what are you going to do about it? Can I turn these off? Can I block them? Firewall rules. If I have a router, maybe I want to do what? Access control list. There's a number of steps I'm going to do. Again, in our field, guys, there's no such thing as a silver bullet. You guys have to think of security as what? An onion. Layers. Multiple layers. You know, maybe I want to run NMAP again. I want to do a stealth scan. I don't want to run a ping scan. Oh, and by the way, with the A modifier, I'm going to find out what operating system I'm talking to. Why not? Tells me a name. Oh, do you guys see a problem with this? I mean, it is Linux Unix, right? Anybody know what Samba is? What is it? Harvey. <laughs> it's an uh, NFS uh, file system that allows Linux gaining access to the tools. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody else over here? Um, yeah, it's the same thing Linux shares. That's it. It comes from what? Server message block. How Windows reads and writes to it. So what do we have to do on the Linux, the X side of the world? We got to make an animal or something out of it somehow. So we just put A's in it and call it Samba. That's the old name. The new name is what? CIFS, Common Internet File System. That's what Microsoft calls it. Basically, it's the same protocol. It's just got a nice new shiny name. That's it. It's still a turd, just a shiny turd. Anyway. Um, if I wasn't using Samba, could I use NFS, Network File System? I could go to the Microsoft site. I could download the protocol. Sure, it's a little bit more secure. Remember, Samba is easy to set up. Easy to set up. Does that tell you something about the security of it? Is it a best practice for what? A bank, a business, engineering firm. Maybe we should start looking at something else. Well, it's DB based. I'm happy with that. Workroom stuff. It's got a website running. Hmm. RPC, remote procedure call, basically reports what it finds. Usually it reports what? Errors. It's an error reporting service. So let's take a look at this guy. I'm going to run it against that IP address, and now it's telling me more information. You got a couple of protocols up there. You've got TCP and UDP. Without going into the, the definitions of what they are, what is the difference between them, though? What's that? Good, which means what? Now I'm going into instructor mode. I want you to talk about that. <laughs> TCP basically does what? It asks me for an acknowledgement. That's it. Did you receive the file? Yes, I did. So if I do a basic file copy, of course you're going to get an acknowledgement because you're talking TCP. UDP, on the other hand, does. It spews. Streaming audio, streaming video, and our favorite service, DNS, which talks on who knows what, port 53. TCP is really easy to trace, isn't it? Because I need an acknowledgement back. Then I can find out where the signal is coming from. I like that. Thank you. Has anybody run TCP done? How many of you guys have heard of Wireshark? Which used to be what? Ethereal or Ethereal, depending on how you wanted to pronounce it. Until the programmer got mad and said, I'm leaving, I'm taking my technology with me. The company said, yeah, but you can't take the name. He's like, okay, I'll just call it something else that's really cool and hideous, like Wireshark. It sounds manly. TCP, dog. Oh, TCP. So I'm only looking for connectivity that's what? Asking for an acknowledgement. Dash I, the interface, ETH0, first Ethernet card. What's my source? What's going to be the target address? No, why not? Let's take a look at Yahoo. Nictu. I didn't put a screen out there, I'm sorry. Nictu dash H. Web server scanner. Oh, this is nice. Isn't everything nowadays web based? Remember, 
some of us older guys, do you remember something that you had to install on a computer to talk to a network? It was a piece of client software. Remember those days? Until everybody else came out with what? Tablets, laptops, everything else. Let's talk through a web browser. Yeah, it's kind of a Do you guys trust online banking? <laughs> it's kind of scary too, isn't it? A couple of years ago, there was a bank in Boston that was actually sending out customers copies of Tails Linux. Boot this up in your computer. I, I can understand the thought process. It's not going to write anything back, right? Because it's on a CD. But who's going to know what to do with it? Because most people thought they were getting a coaster in the mail. And it's a shiny one. Does anybody remember the port number for a secure connection, HTTPS? Thank you, 443. Good. All right, so Apache Box. It's got PHP loaded. Huh. So what am I doing with these tools that I've shown you so far? I'm doing reconnaissance. I read an article in USA Today. Most hackers do it for the money. They're well-organized, well-funded. Do you believe that? There's no such thing as the guy, Kevin Smith guy, sitting at home in his mom's basement. <coughs> you think that still exists? It's kind of scary, isn't it? When I worked at Arrow several years ago, um, all of a sudden our website was defaced. But the thing about it, I wasn't doing my job, going back through the logs, went back through the anomalies. I think I said that right. Not going back to the patches. I wasn't keeping up on what I should have been keeping up on. And guess what? One of the days the website was defaced. The thing about it though, the attacker started three months before it actually happened. A little bit at a time. I'm gonna knock on the door at four o'clock. See who's there. Nobody's there. Maybe I'll try a little bit later. I'll try a little bit later. What was he doing? Reconnaissance. He was gathering information. Ever use Puck Web? It recognizes web technologies. Target, dash four, A4, all the thing. What I want to do, it takes a look at JavaScript. Next screen. Well, it's telling me it's an Apache box. It's telling me the IP address, the version of PHP, web dev, powered by that. With all the web technologies that are out there, I'm not just going to attack an Apache server or an IS, IIS server. I might want to attack all the other things that are built into it. Do you think HTTP is secure? Do you think the coding for HTTPS is secure? How about XML, XTML, jQuery, all the other Ruby, all the other alphabet soup that's out there? Each one of those has their own strengths and weaknesses, correct? All I have to do is find weaknesses. As we all know, if something is a little bit too difficult, I'm going to go find a target that's easy. There's a lot of targets out there. So why not take a look at the build up? And again, somebody may have updated the operating system. Did they update all the structure behind it? Did they also update anything that goes with it? Did they update the application? Or here you go, the wireless firmware. Have you heard of Zen now? Maybe you don't like to use Nmap because it's all, you know, gives you text stuff. But what's cool about Zenmap, you get a nice picture. I like pictures. You know what this kind of reminds me of? Again, old Unix guy. Reminds me of HP OpenView. And then I can click on it. I can move things around. We like pictures. This is really slick. Zenmap. Sits on top of Nmap. It's just a GUI for it. And the thing about it, I don't even have to type in an IP address. It does a DNS lookup for me. Have you heard of Shodan? This is one of your evil friends. Be nice to your evil friends. 
This could be the Joe Pesci of your evil friends. Shodan HQ. What do you want to find, guys? Do you want to type in find open HP 2200 web servers? Enter. Go get some coffee. It will help you. It will help you do reconnaissance. It is a really interesting tool. And again, use your powers for good. Um, here's something for you to really type in when you're in your mom's basement with Kevin Smith. Type in like open webcams. <whistles> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of scary what's out there, guys. Mm. Shodan is a really interesting tool. Dimitri, you know, maybe I do want to go after a main site, but I want to find out all the minor sites that go into it. Dimitri, dash at us, because I'm looking for all the subdivisions of it. A domain, don't you have to give it an IP address? Why? Because it will give me the IP addresses automatically. It will tell me, if I go to CNN.com, it tells me the web server address for edition.cnn.com, money, weather, the mobile edition. Helps me do what? My reconnaissance that much quicker. Well, that's kind of slick. I can target exactly what I want to take a look at, like maybe the mobile side of the house. Why not? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm depressed with the news and I want to make my own news and put it out there. Why not? This is kind of scary, scary too, isn't it? And again, I've shown you a bunch of reconnaissance tools. One more thing. Who said this? This was Jobs too. And it usually always became before what? Some way cool thing that he came up with. Yeah, let me show you about this stuff. Do you honestly think there would be a $17,000 Apple watch thing if he was still around? Or iPhones that are in color? Really? <laughs> <laughs> really? Gazelle, or you're trying to get rid of your stuff. One more thing. For some of you guys that don't know what's coming up, and you know what's coming up, don't say anything. What are some ways that I can attack a computer? Now, I'll, give, I'll start you out. How about the operating system? Regardless of the operating system, don't you think it's important to patch secure best practices? You guys agree with that? Common practices, good. Memory. Memory. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. There are a bunch of memory grabbers that are out there which are really, really good. Um, FBI friend of mine showed me a few years ago on YouTube that typical memory will resolve, whatever, within a few minutes. If you had dry ice, you could keep it active for like 45 minutes and pull stuff off of it. Guys, there's videos on this. <laughs> it's like voodoo magic stuff. So I can attack the operating system, right? How about the application? Sure. What are some other ways that I can attack a computer keeping that kind of process in mind? Yes. <laughs> I could do that. Yes. What else could I do? What are some things that should be installed on a computer, but typically what Mr. and Mrs. America or Mr. and Mrs. Business Person doesn't know about? What else? Do you think intrusion detection software is that good? Yeah, it's uh, all right. So it's letting you know something could be happening. I appreciate that. Thank you. You also mentioned antivirus. Huh? So you honestly think that antivirus might be something good to attack to? Yes, it does, doesn't it? How many of you guys have heard this before? Um, the operating system came with it, so I turned it on. <laughs> Don't you feel bad for the computer? You just want to save the computer. You just want to give them an inch of sketch with a cord hanging off the back. <laughs> We've all thought about it. You wanted to do it. Kelly has many built-in tools. And again, give it a few gig, but you guys 
just want to add more things to it. You want to add more to the arsenal. Bale is your other evil friend. <laughs> Bale is the Michael Corleone of the tools. Remote shell payload generator can bypass many antivirus programs. The cool thing about Veil, for a lot of you people that know this already, I can run Veil, and basically I can pick and choose what I want. It'll make a batch file for me. I just send it to my victim's computer, and then after so much time, it'll do an SSH connection back to me. I don't have to go looking for it anymore. It tries to dial home and basically says, what do you want? Because what did you do? You cracked on something people thought much. I've got antivirus on it, it's great. I installed it four and a half years ago, it's wonderful. Or better yet, well, I disabled the antivirus because my computer was slow. Hmm. How many of us have heard that before too? Well, the company's antivirus will catch everything. Yeah, and it spreads it around too, like a big, nasty virus thing. <laughs> Veil is pure evil. <laughs> so I go to app get install Veil. He goes through it, crunches some things, and installs it. I run the dot wax setup dot shush. And it says, press enter for payload. Give me a name for the file. Here you go. Here's a really good name to give anybody. Family vacation picks dot bat. Oh, we need that because it's the family stuff. That's cool. And you know the user's gonna click on it, right? How many of your users and people that you know when they download an email attachment, it's got all the pictures there. Oh, it's very, very easy for me to hide stuff in a picture, right? Steganography, there's a bunch of freeware stuff out there. How many of you guys remember a movie years ago uh, called Along Came a Spider? Morgan Freeman and Monica Potter from Acro. Little kids at the very beginning of the movie were passing around a picture with Michael Jordan and it had information written inside it. And what were they using? A program like Autopsy or Scalpel is my favorite. If it's not the graphic file, but it's left, it must be the truth, correct? It must be the data that you're looking for. Oops. And basically all they have to do is distribute the payload and go ahead and put some times and things on it that may be three and a half months from now, 3.30 in the morning, does an SSH connection back to me. And basically, what do you want? Why should I have to go hacking things when I can just send out batch files that people are going to download, click on, and then connect back to me later? That's kind of cool. It takes all the work. I don't have to do any more. I, don't have, I have to do less work now because of this. Bail is your evil friend. Find all the stuff. The quieter you become, the more you can hear. This is all over the site. And again, email me if you want this presentation and a lot of the other documentation that I do. And again, I've got a bunch of hands-on labs um, using the Metasploitable environment. Practice your crap in a controlled environment. Don't unleash your tools in when you're not certain of it. Or use your powers for good. <laughs> um, give away a book. The gentleman up front gave me a book that I'm going to be giving away. All depending on what trivia question. Callie or Kali is based on an Indian guy, which is based on what religion? <laughs> Fell on the back in the blue shirt, raised his hand first. Indian. Indian. You work for Exeter? I work for a really nice Indian lady. And I said, why does this look so scary? BMC server. That's about it. <laughs> That's all I use it for. That's <laughs> all I use it for. It works great. Though. It does. It works flawless. It works really, really well. Thank you. You guys have any other questions, concerns? 
Did you find this informative? Did you? Is this what you came here for tonight? Good. Thank you very much. So this talk is, uh, I saw we had a couple pen testers here. Do we have any, I assume everybody here is pretty much security guys, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, this talk is mainly about a crazy policy at Hurricane Labs. I don't mean this to be some advertisement for Hurricane Labs, but I'm gonna say Hurricane Labs way too many times, and I apologize for that ahead of time. It's just. All of this takes place in Hurricane Lab setting, which has a, uh, a strange policy, uh, which I'll tell you about. The, um, the first day at Hurricane Labs, before I finished installing my operating system, the lead system administrator was trying to backdoor it. Uh, I left to go talk to a manager, the secretary, about uh, like W-2 form, or the all the tax stuff that I need to fill out. And in the couple minutes that I was gone, he was installing a root user. Um, we, we take security very seriously since we are a security company. So we test all of our own security, including each other's laptops, whenever possible. So if you leave your computer unlocked, the first time you'll likely send out an email that says free beer. Uh, the next time you may have to reinstall your entire operating system. Uh, so, I became incredibly paranoid really early. Uh, so, I uh, tried to learn a great deal about how to stop these attacks, because there's some weird stuff. I had heard of DMA attacks from um, an I a malicious iPod that someone had. I've heard all, all kinds of strange stuff. So. Uh, so anyways, all of this talk is in this environment where all the computers are either Mac or Linux, because that's how Hurricane Labs does it. Every user at Hurricane Labs is required to have full disk encryption, so all the attacks are on the full disk encryption. If you don't have full disk encryption, then as soon as someone gets five minutes alone with your computer, they're going to, mod they're going to pull the hard drive out physically and modify it. Um, Everybody locks their computer religiously. They learn very quickly to do so. And uh, we're under this constant threat. And that's, the, uh, that's what uh, has inspired most of this stuff. Uh, but we're also to be nice, because we're also supposed to do real work. And it's not good if you have to reinstall your operating system every day. If you're working on uh, a firewall issue or something like that, I'm not, we're not going to destroy your laptop and make customers angry. So uh, these are the attacks and ways of defending that I've used at my job or that have been used around. The, the, I guess they're the ones that I like the best. Uh, the first one is a one-way authentication screensaver. Or, uh, screensavers generally are one-way authentication. It's kind of silly to think of a mutual authentication screensaver, but there's a problem with that. When you leave your computer and it looks like this parody of a, an Ubuntu lock screen, and you come back and it looks like this lock screen, there's no reason not to type your password into it, right? Uh, there's nothing that seems out of place about these two images. You have an image that you left, and when you come back, it's the exact same image. So uh, there's a someone that I worked with that uh, I particularly wanted to mess with, and uh, I did so by switching his screensaver with a malicious one. So there's three attack vectors. The story with this guy was, we, um, the original idea was 
everybody there, everybody at Hurricane Labs has a computer that looks exactly the same. My company just bought a ton of them at once, gave each person a computer. There's no difference between my computer and the guys next to me other than this pretty picture that I decided to put up. Um, if the guy next to me, when I left, physically switched my computers and mimicked my screensaver, there'd be no way for me to tell. If I type my password into his computer, then uh, he would then have my password in his logs if he was logging that stuff. Um, and that was the original idea, the switch to the laptop idea. But it got better when I realized that uh, this guy that I was interested in didn't have a BIOS password that restricted the um, boot device. Uh, and later I realized you can get around that anyways. So um, even if they do have a BIOS password, what you do is you make a live distribution of whatever Linux flavor you like, something really light preferably, make a malicious screensaver uh, that looks exactly like their screensaver, put, the, uh, put all that on a USB drive, turn their computer off, hard boot their computer, plug in the USB drive, boot the computer into the USB drive, into the live distribution that you created, um, a screensaver will pop up on the screen that looks exactly like his screensaver, but if you type the password in, it sends the password through a socket to a remote location where uh, I get to have the password. Uh, after three password attempts, uh, my screensaver caused a malloc fork bomb, uh, which eats up resources really fast and kills the computer. So this guy left, came back, his computer looked exactly the same, but it was running my malicious uh, operating system. He typed in his password. It didn't let him in. Uh, it, will, it won't let you in, period. After three attempts, his computer locked up. Uh, I informed him that he dropped out of chat, and are you doing all right? Is everything OK? And he has you know, Linux problems and blah, blah, blah. Hard boots his computer, turns it back on. Um, uh, the USB drive doesn't have to stay in the computer the entire time because uh, once, the ex once the screensaver starts, it's loaded into the, the executable's loaded into memory, so you can pull the USB drive out. It doesn't have to load anything from the USB drive at that point. So, um, uh, so yeah, the, uh, uh, it gets you... Uh, oh, and the, uh, the other way to do it is uh, you can switch what user uh, is on the system on a like Ubuntu systems have a guest user, so a so the guest user can go on websites, right? Uh, Ubuntu comes with a guest session by default that's just enabled, and anyone that feels like it can from the screensaver get to the guest session. So my wife was kind enough to make a website for me that probably won't look very good because of the resolution. Um, I gotta find my mouse. Yeah, that didn't work. Hold on a second. <laughs> Does that look familiar? You guys know Ubuntu at all? So uh, uh, the username and the ASDF here, those are the username and the host name. Uh, you can get that from information on the computer. So the idea is you have a USB drive or a, a ducky. You guys know what a ducky is? Um, just it types. It's a keyboard that is preset to type these keys. So when you plug it in, it registers as a keyboard and it types out the message you sent it to. So you plug in a ducky and the ducky hits down and left and all that kind of stuff in order to switch to a guest session and it hits control alt t to uh, open up a uh, terminal then it uses curl to go get or wget uh, i don't think curl's in most it, it uses whatever to pull down a bash script bash script runs which is allowed to do in guest session guest session though restricts the hard drive so none of this will be saved and it also restricts what the user is capable of modifying that he can't get to root privileges and those kinds of things. Um, anyways, pulls down this uh, bash script. The bash script just opens up this web page and full screens it. And uh, when you type in 
this isn't done yet, but when you type in the password, whatever it is, um, this is the password. I probably misspelled that. Then it sends a request to my web server with the, this is the password inside of it. So in a, with a ducky, you can probably do this attack. I haven't done this attack yet. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, you can probably carry this out in uh, a minute or so. So when they go to the bathroom, uh, everything looks normal. The username and the host name can be gathered from uh, information that the guest session is capable of obtaining. Um, the background image, uh, you'll have to look for yourself if they have a custom background. Um, you guys clear on that? Well, feel free to yell at me and all that. I'm, I, yeah. <laughs> so those are the three ways that I figure I can mess with someone's screensaver. The um, we did a we did a on-site test once uh, a while back where we had a uh, a window. Oh yeah. Uh, the original attack that I did, the only version of this attack that I've actually successfully pulled off, I made the, the victim was using X screensaver, which is a screensaver for Linux. I grabbed the source code and modified it to add the malloc fork bomb and all those kinds of things, uh, and then installed it. The, uh, there was a lot more work that needed, than needed to be done. You can just do it with the website, like I showed you. And then that website, as long as it looks like the screensaver, um, is the screensaver as far as they know. So the same works for an Apple or Macintosh computer, whatever, as long as the image looks like the image they left. And as long as the page reacts in a similar way. And the page should not be very reactive because of the nature of screensavers. You don't want to... The more the screensaver can do, the more likely you can crash it. Uh, yeah. We... <laughs> Uh, you should always touch your screensaver screen saver from crashing, too, by the way. Because um, uh, people at my work will test it for you. There's, there was an old debug in uh, Ubuntu that if you, moved, if you had two monitors and you moved the mouse to the second monitor and unplugged the second monitor, the Ubuntu lock screen was trying to map your mouse to a location that didn't exist anymore and it would crash the Ubuntu lock screen and just give you the operating system. <laughs> uh, also, laptops tend to not handle closing them very well. A lot of them, depending on how they're configured, with with Linux computers at least. So uh, that's a good thing to test. So when people leave, we just like start shutting the computer and shaking the mouse and doing stupid stuff. Um, so the defense from this attack is really dumb and ridiculous because I invented it, and I'm not a developer. I just play with things for fun. Um, the screensaver the screensaver needs to prove that my computer needs to prove that it's my computer to me. And it needs to do that before I go typing passwords into it. So my original idea was two-factor, that you know two-factor will fix anything. So if I type in a two-factor token, then uh, it's still one way off from me to my computer in order for my computer to say that's the right two-factor token because a malicious screensaver is just going to say that's the right two-factor token regardless. So I need something that my computer outputs to me that I can verify. Um, I also don't want to, I don't want to connect anything to a computer that might be malicious. I don't want to plug my phone into one. I, I also don't want to do Wi-Fi or a wireless protocol because if someone just physically takes my computer in another room and leaves a duplicate, uh, so like, if my phone connects to my computer over Wi-Fi and makes this picture pop up on my screen, then I know it's good. Um, if someone's in the other room just broadcasting the screen to the malicious computer, I don't know if my phone is connected to my computer or the other computer. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's, it's hard to figure it out. The, um, what I eventually came up with uh, so yeah, the, what I want is no connections. I want it to be is easily visualized. I want it to be, uh, my idea was, I want to do cryptography, you know, mutual authentication is a field of cryptography or something that cryptography solves. But I'm not good at, I'm not that good at doing math in my head. And if I just print out a hash on a screen, 
that's an easily visual that's an easy thing for a computer to duplicate. I could take a picture with my cell phone and then have software that fixes that image and transmits it properly because the um, numbers are so standardized. So um, I'll show you the solution I came up with. This is a, a version of the screensaver I have. That looks terrible. Hold on, I'll give you a different one. This one's the, probably the more visual, but it'll make you throw up maybe. So when you come back from your computer, it looks like this. Um, it is a, a fancy Julia set fractal image, one of those computer generated images that are neat and all that. Um, but in every 30 seconds it changes. It's skewed, as you can see. Um, the idea is uh, if, if me and Corey wanted to meet somewhere and I knew we had a secure channel to communicate where I knew that me and Corey were me and Corey, and I, I, could, com I could give him a um, set of moves to do on a Rubik's Cube. And then when we meet over an insecure channel in, in person, and I want to prove that it was the person that I was talking to, I can hand him a mixed up Rubik's Cube. If he knows the set of Rubik's Cube moves that I gave him, then he should be able to solve the Rubik's Cube. But that proves that he is who he says he is to me. But additionally, Corey knows that it's me uh, because the Rubik's Cube wouldn't have been solved by the moves that he did unless uh, I knew the moves beforehand barring the difficulty of solving Rubik's Cubes. Um, so this is a Julia set, which uh, has a lot of has a lot of uh, symmetry and that kind of a thing that you can detect when it's solved. So the, there's a two-factor token, the same Google two-factor system. Uh, that the Google two-factor app, you know, uh, using one of nine functions in order to mix up this image according to the Google two-factor app. Uh, it's the TOTP protocol. So when I type in the correct code, 59976, uh, it unmixes up the image into, that's not the right image. Four seven six. That's not right. I'm sorry. I'm typing it bad. Five nine nine four seven six. It's changed image. <laughs> Hold on a second. I'm sorry. seconds now. But to show you, these are the kind of images it creates, which all have a, a certain symmetry and beauty to them. Or at least I'd like to think because I'm a math nerd. Um, then to them uh, messed up though, it looks like this. Uh, currently it only uses like, at one point I had, I'm trying to it's very difficult to find a good function to, un to unmess this up because um, if I give the Rubik's Cube to somebody and he turned his back and solved it and then came back and showed it was solved, it wouldn't prove that he was him. So if I, uh, if I type stuff and things just happen and it's solved, it doesn't prove that my computer knew it beforehand. It just shows that my computer can unswoops an image uh, whenever I hit a key. So I need each each uh, function to do something uh, predetermined. Uh, so I'll show you the. This is the program, or this is the version that I used to test it. This is with no nothing applied to it. If I hit the one key, then there's a sinusoidal wave applied to it uh, horizontally, which increases each time you hit it. Two is vertical. Three is a tangent, uh, four is a tangent the other way, five is a tessellation, six is uh, one over again uh, because I don't have t 
10 of them yet. Uh, but then the idea is no one else, even though um, the source code for this is on my GitHub, uh, you guys can pull it down of a version of this because I don't have it working all the way yet. So I'm not going to give you the one that I actually use. Um, the one that I use, I'll actually lock my screen and show you. Uh, I don't, I can't currently, whenever I hit a key, a screensaver's purpose is when you hit a key, the lockbox is supposed to pop up. Your key presses should not go to the operating system. It should grab every single key press. And X screensaver does uh, too good of a job of this and won't allow you to mute your computer while it's running. It won't allow volume keys, keys to go past because those keys might do something bad or for some reason. So, um, uh, so currently, even though what I showed you, I can type in the key presses and make it um, solve the Rubik's Cube, so to speak, the, uh, when it actually acts as a screensaver, it does not work just yet. I, uh, there's some PAM hacking that I need to do in order to get my key presses from X screensaver into the, X screensaver calls them hacks that's running underneath X screensaver. Uh, but uh, I'm figuring that out now. You guys are welcome to play with the source code as it is. It's, it's just a proof of concept and it's really rough. And yeah, this is getting into why my solution isn't so good. It also stinks to try and type in that token every time you come back from the bathroom. So I expect I'm just not going to use it. Um, so uh, the, I, an alternative idea, the original idea was a visual hash. The same kind of fractal image created, but one that's completely random. The, the Julia set, despite looking random, isn't random. It's generated from a point on the screen. And once you've seen enough of them, you can kind of guess about where the point would be. And if you guess close to the point, it still looks about right, uh, which isn't desirable in a hashing algorithm. Uh, you want any different, slightly different value in input to make a much bigger different value and output so that if an attacker gets it just a little bit off, it'll be obvious as it is uh, the Julia set isn't good for that. But more preferably would be as if I had an animated background on my cell phone that was uh, the same animated background as my laptop. And then, uh, then all I would have to do is this and verify that this image is the image on my computer and I would be safe. Um, and then that syncing value would be with TOTP or something like that that doesn't require a connection. Uh, TOTP is essentially just a uh, HMAC SHA-1 hash of a secret and a uh, and the time, an epoch. Um, or, and uh, the epoch time mod 30, the every, or uh, divided by 30, I'm sorry, every 30 increments there's a new secret, or a new uh, TOTP token. So it doesn't require any internet connection. It doesn't require my phone to connect to my computer. It just requires an agreeing on that secret. Uh, do you guys understand that? <laughs> yeah? All right. Uh, feel free to ask questions or tell me I'm going too fast or that I'm stupid or whatever you want. I'm, I'm a really easygoing guy. I'm used to, I used to be a professional magician, so I'm used to um, performing and having people pick cards and yelling at people and then yelling back at me. So. Feel free to do whatever. Um, so uh, that's uh, the first thing. That was my favorite thing that I've ever done to break into anyone's computer ever. Um, mostly because of how long it took and how dumb of an idea it was. Um, also, the target was made it even better. Um, the This is the second best thing that I've done, probably. I wanted to go ahead and show you the first thing in case people had to leave or something. Um, second best thing. Um, of Linux by default does not have an encrypted boot partition. So if you um, if you install whatever your Linux uh, Debian and Ubuntu by default will, uh, as you install, uh, there's an option for encrypted LVM. Um, those will encrypt encrypt. You can encrypt your home directory. You can encrypt encrypt sorry the entire root partition, um, but. Uh, it will not, by default, encrypt your boot partition. I, up until a couple, up until a month ago, thought that it was impossible to encrypt your boot partition because Grub, the bootloader, 
Uh, so BIOS boots the beginning, the MBR of whatever uh, disk you tell it to boot. At the beginning of that is an executable with bytecode that says, uh, that starts in, with, in the Linux world, generally grub. Grub starts running, and then it starts to boot the boot partition where the RAM disk is, and the RAM disk is kind of like a little miniaturized version of Linux to get things in order before it hands it over to the big, uh, real Linux. So uh, the boot partition, if it's encrypted, Grub would have to be able to unencrypt it first, which I had read everywhere that is impossible, that Grub cannot do it. It turns out Grub can do this, and that's how this computer is set up. I don't have this in my slides, but if you Google, um, I got this fancy new computer, and because of the crazy graphics card that's in it, I couldn't run Debian on it without spending six hours trying to debug the GPU. So um, I tried Arch out for a couple minutes, and it worked out of the box, which is weird when Arch just works. So uh, anyways, I'm using Arch now, so just to alleviate the headache of dual monitors. Uh, but in researching on how to do some weird install that I would have done uh, to save my unencrypted boot directory, I found a blog post by a guy who explains how you can encrypt your boot directory and have Grub decrypt it. Uh, so if you Google around, if you Google for Arch full disk encryption, including boot, uh, I think it's like the third link on the page. He has another instruction. He has a is another way to do it with Mint, and then with Mint it should uh, follow similar for Debian and Ubuntu and all those, a lot of the other distributions. Um, at any rate, before I knew about this and before anyone at my company knew about this, everyone was required to have full disk encryption, but no one had an encrypted boot partition. Uh, and inside the encrypted boot partition is your RAM disk, which runs code. So there's something that runs code that's unencrypted on your computer. There's no checksums to verify it. Uh, so I can change it and make it run what code I want it to if I can just get my greedy little hands on it. Um, so the uh, because of that, my solution, my solution originally, the before I made these, before I found out about this, when I made these slides was to put my boot partition on side of, inside a USB drive. So when you install, just go to uh, manual, uh, manual partitioning and set um, SDC1 or whatever you want, SDC2 actually, uh, put two partitions on it, and then the first partition make it a FAT32, the second partition exit two, and then if a Windows user finds it, he won't know there's a boot partition on it. Um, but the, uh, Put the boot partition on this, and then uh, you put the uh, MBR at the beginning of it with grub on it, boot from this, and uh, then in or anyone that wants to backdoor my boot partition has to get this out of my pocket, which is good and bad. It's good because I tend to leave my computer places when I go to the bathroom and whatnot. It's bad, though, because I can leave this somewhere a lot easier than I can leave my computer. But, if an attacker wants to root my boot partition, he's not going to be able to use my operating system, probably. Or I guess he could live boot. But the easiest way would be to pull out my hard drive, plug it into something, run code, put it back in, and close it up, which takes some time uh, and looks conspicuous if you try it at a coffee shop or something. Um, this, though, if I leave laying around at a coffee shop and I go to the bathroom, he can, someone can pick this up, plug it in, root it, and then unplug it, if they know what they're doing and they're prepared. Um, one of the guys that I work with uh, would have his boot partition on his USB drive because it was unencrypted and he was paranoid, but he always left it in his computer when he went to go to get a coffee. So every morning, uh, he'd turn his computer on, and it takes a while to turn on, so once he unencrypted his uh, root partition and it was loading all the Linux stuff, you'd go to get a coffee and then you'd come back. So in the meantime, I wrote a script that as soon as you would plug in a USB drive, it would look for the RAM disk, um, and it's a CPIO gzipped file that just has your Linux, uh, mini Linux distribution inside of it, 
and there it added a couple lines to the init script, which is the first thing that runs, and it waits. The lines that I added created a backdoor in Network Manager that would connect back to my computer whenever you went into, uh, logged into Wi-Fi. But only Wi-Fi at Hurricane Labs, because they didn't want it to look like you had viruses at a customer's place or something. <laughs> so, um, so that's how that works. Any questions? Everything good? Cool. That was a lot of fun. And he's terrified now. If you go near his computer and just like brush by the USB ports, he yells at you and stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of that at my work. We, um, yeah. So, um, I'm going really fast. So if you guys want, I'll try and tell more stories about some of the crazy, the weird stuff that we've done. Like the, uh, the original, the, the first person at my company that I know of to switch laptops with someone did it in a very, um, a lot of people just install Ubuntu because it's easy, especially for the operational guys that um, manage stuff. Anyway, they just install Ubuntu in general. So uh, uh, one guy was sitting down working on something, another guy was sitting next to him working on stuff. He got up to go to the bathroom and left his computer unlocked. So my buddy, uh, Joe, realized that if he just starts typing on his computer, in like two seconds he'll come back and catch him. So he locked, Joe locked his own screen, switched laptops, and turned so that the guy couldn't see the screen of his laptop, and then started talking to his wife on Instant Messenger. Um, <laughs> um, came out to her and everything. And then, uh, <laughs> Then uh, the other guy kept trying to log into his computer for a little bit, then realized it and all that. So, uh, oh yeah, so the, the Ducky stuff. You guys know what a Ducky is already? There's a lot of stuff online that seems to make it to be like the be all, end all hacking extravaganza of some sort. The, um, a Ducky is just a USB uh, keyboard. Uh, it might also be a mouse now too. There's someone that came out with alternative firmware and what was original with it. You can do a couple more tricky things. Is it a mouse too? Do you guys know? Um, you can also make it a... Uh, so anyway, I don't think I brought mine with me. It looks just like a USB drive. Um, and when you plug it in, it is... You, uh, there's some Java stuff that you run in order to set up a payload on a mini SD card. Plug that into the ducky, put the little plastic shell over the ducky to make it look like it's a normal USB drive. And then when you plug it in, anything that you put in that SD card will start typing on the computer. So uh, it's, and it types incredibly fast. So I keep one near my desk with a payload that will download a, a script and run it uh, for anyone that leaves their computer unlocked at my work. And uh, we've had one of my colleagues have like burst into the room, like, where's the ducky? And they throw it at him. And run it <laughs> so, um, it, uh, yeah, so in three seconds it'll type uh, a bunch of junk, including control alt t to bring up a terminal, or uh, uh, control r for the run dialog in Windows. Um, the, the attack surface isn't as big as what I think a lot of people want you to think. And at least at my company. My company, we lock our computers religiously. So if you come over with a USB drive, a, uh, a keyboard, and plug in a keyboard and start typing on it, it's just going into the lock screen and that's not doing anything. Um, where it does come in handy is we had a guy who, um, we realized that whenever his computer, he's in a cubicle, and uh, if, the wall of the, if the opening of the cubicle is here, his computer is the exact opposite, okay? Um, so he sits and types here, looking at his keyboard, of course, or looking at his computer, of course. And if you ask him a question, he'll turn all the way around to talk to you. Um, and this was at a time when the company used ThinkPads that had a USB port on the back of them here. So uh, I conspired. So many of the people at our company realized that it's not good that there's a USB port that you can't see whenever, at all times. So they'll plug in. A your mouse into that keyboard, into that port, so that your mouse will work. If your mouse works, then it's plugged in. So this guy did that. When he went out to lunch, I plugged in a USB hub into that port, plugged his mouse into that, <laughs> plugged a USB extension cord into that, and ran the cord underneath the cubicle to the next cubicle. 
I plug the ducky in then, it would just type in a bunch of gibberish into his screensaver, and then the password probably, his password doesn't probably, probably doesn't begin with a curl command. So um, when he came back, just after he had locked his computer, before he gets to play around much with his computer and see something, um, my buddy Patrick, who's an amazing social engineer, came over and started asking him about that new video game that he had just purchased. He turned all the way around, and when he did so, I was in the cubicle over just holding the um, USB extension cord, like waiting for that moment, <laughs> uh, waiting for the chair swivel noise, and then plugged it in, waited like it should have been done, and then unplugged it and left. And then we had a reverse shell when we got back to our computers. Um, then we cleaned up after ourselves by, I made a USB drive that had a whole bunch of partitions on it, as many as I could make, and each partition had 999 files, each file named virus 001, virus 002, and then I went over there and plugged that in, so then on Ubuntu it automatically mounts each partition and pops a screen up, so just the screen sort of <laughs> popping up filled with virus numbers, <laughs> so, um, uh, which is all benign, it's not going to do anything, the text files were completely empty, um, so, uh, but it allows me to get rid of that USB cord. There's a reason for that USB cord now. We did it, it was just a prank. Don't worry about it. You don't have to look into your logs. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, um, so then, yeah, so then we could clean up after ourselves. We made it look like we did something malicious, but not something really malicious, just a dumb prank. But we got control of this computer and made it talk to him. Uh, it's always weird. It's weird once you get control of an employee's computer, because security is hard. It's not easy to do this stuff, especially when you have people that spend their free time making cryptographic screensavers and stuff. So, uh, or um, I wrote a Pigeon plugin that's a shell, so I can uh, send shell commands through Pigeon, and it works with OTR, the encryption mechanism that you can have. So it works under OTR, um, and it doesn't show up in their log files, it doesn't show up in their plugins list, and it doesn't show up uh, on the screen when they type stuff in. So I do that stuff for fun, and that's what they're, it stinks to work with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so it's always weird to like tell somebody that like, um, I rooted you, I'm sorry, you shouldn't have left your computer unlocked, because I feel bad. So we made this, first we made is disk drive eject, there's a one in 200 chance of his disk drive ejecting every weird hour of the day, but only if he was at Hurricane Labs, because um, <laughs> we didn't want him to look like he had viruses somewhere else. Um, and then, uh, then we started making his computer talk to him and some other stuff. Um, anyways, the defense for that is you, you need to be able to see all of your USB ports. Um, I know a few people at least had considered putting epoxy in that port in the back of their computer. Um, because of that port, I wrote a UDEV rule. Uh, UDEV is what Linux uses in order to manage devices. So when you plug in a USB drive, uh, UDEV kicks in and uh, it goes through a list of rules to decide what to do with that USB device. I wrote a UDEV rule that blocks all USB devices. Um, my original idea was to blacklist the ducky, but there's firmware that you can use on the ducky as, you know, the ducky provides, uh, each USB device has a product ID and a vendor ID and those kinds of things, so I wanted to block those. But it's the ducky that tells you the product ID and the vendor ID. So the ducky can tell you any product ID or vendor ID with uh, some of the firmware they have for it. So you can't block any of it. So you can only whitelist your stuff and blacklist every, everything else, but all they have to do to bypass that is to unplug your keyboard plug it into your, their computer, get its vendor ID and product ID, and then duplicate it with the ducky. So blacklisting and whitelisting doesn't work in, in the strictest sense. Um, so uh, I blocked everything, um, which stinks though because the people that I work with are dicks, so they would come over and unplug my keyboard, and then I have to use my crappy laptop keyboard to get back into the system, and then use sudo to get to revoke my UDEV rule that I spent so much time working on, and then plug the keyboard back in, and then put the rule back in, and then they just unplug it again. So I, I wrote a, um, uh, a program called UDEV Paranoia. It's on my, uh, it's on my GitHub also. 
It's already in C, so it can be, uh, so you can set the set UID bit, and all it does is make that file or delete it. It will also make the file with a rule that will only allow, that will allow anything that is not a keyboard. So if you plug in a ducky, um, there's a, some work, there's a DEF CON presentation on bad USB, or, um, yeah, was it DEF CON? There's a DEF CON presentation on bad USB where they modified the USB, a uh, real USB thumb drive's firmware in order to make it malicious and do the same thing a ducky does. Um, and there's, you can't tell, that means that like this USB that I have in my pocket that I may have left out for a couple minutes on my desk might be a bad USB. When I plug it in, it still works like a normal USB, but 10 minutes later when I have my back turned, it does something malicious by typing in commands in my shell. So um, uh, I had a rule for a while that would block anything that was a keyboard, but allow anything that was not a keyboard. So even if you plugged in a bad USB USB device, the keyboard would not be allowed to register, but the USB device as a storage device would be able to register. Um, it hasn't worked. It worked on, uh, I was running Kali at the time and it worked on that. Um, but it doesn't seem to work on a version of Ubuntu that a buddy of mine tried it on or on uh, Arch that I'm running. So I need to figure out, I've tried to figure it out, I haven't figured it out exactly. If you guys know UDev and can figure it out and email me, I'll fix it. But uh, that's what it is now. Um, Uh, so, all that being said, the, uh, any questions on that stuff? Any ideas or, that's cool. So we, um, uh, this next section, the last section is kind of um, bonus material, I guess. This is stuff that, I like playing with my computer and just thinking of silly things, like, um, I'm working on writing a pigeon plugin that will that I can put on someone's computer that when I type in um, uh, Team Rocket, they'll change their nickname to Jesse or James, <laughs> one of them, and then they'll do the Team Rocket back and forth, but they won't know that they themselves are saying this, that it, it'll block that input from themselves in chat. Um, I also had the idea because I was trying to think of ways that I could nicely tell somebody, but it's still in kind of an insulting manner that I had rooted them, or in a fun way. So another thing I was thinking of doing was, uh, like, uh, if I type in the chat, where's my friends at, or something like that, then you would automatically respond. Um, but you couldn't see that you yourself were responding, but you could see other people responding. So you know that someone at the company had been rooted, um, and it could be you, but that person doesn't seem to know it's them, so there's no way to figure it out. So then it becomes a neat game to try and figure out, a neat logic puzzle, you know, to try and figure out if uh, I've broken into your computer. Which there's a trick to cheating at, because we have a bot that sits in chat, so if you, uh, it'll respond to websites and tell you the title. So if you changed your username to a website name, when I said where are my friends at, it'll post, if you, um, if you respond, then it'll show the website, and then the bot would respond to the website that you posted, and then you would know that you were, yeah, that's the stuff I think about, I'm sorry. Um, uh, anyways, the, uh, so this is other stuff that I was thinking about. There was a presentation at uh, DerbyCon a long time ago, when I just started getting into Linux stuff, uh, by um, Int80, or dual core of Int80, if you guys know who he is. Um, he's, uh, he had a, presentation on anti-forensics, and it was weird stuff that he did to his backtrack box to stop uh, forensics and investigators. Because um, he used to do a forensics challenge where he worked at, and he had some really neat ideas on how to protect your laptop. So I implemented those which don't work well at my job because of the be nice policy. Um, one of the best ways to steal someone's computer is just to physically take it and run away with it, and we're not allowed to do that at my job. Um, so, anyways, I built that stuff into my computer, and I'll tell you about it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you guys have figured out I'm paranoid, right? So, I'm, I'm, uh, I've, uh, what I've done, so I'm always afraid that, like, 
uh, I'm going to go to the bathroom while I'm at a coffee shop. I don't want to take my laptop with me to the bathroom. I don't want to turn it off and close it. I don't want to close it because my screensaver might crash. I wrote it. I, <laughs> I, I just want to leave it there, let it be locked, and then come back to it and find out where it was. I don't want to have to deal with security. Security is hard. It stinks. It's a lot of, um, I get to type two-factor tokens now to get into my computer. It's horrible. So I want to, um, I wanted to be able to leave my laptop alone. I wanted to not be scared about a lot of this stuff. Um, so also, uh, on this laptop, because I'm a penetration tester, there's pretty much instructions on how to break into people's websites that I've broken into. Uh, so it's important that no one gets that if they get my laptop. Uh, so I wanted a way that I could secure my laptop strongly so that if someone awesome at computers grabbed it, there wouldn't be anything that he could do to it to get the good stuff. But additionally, if someone who's an idiot grabbed it, I want to get a little bit more out of the idiot. I feel like I should be able to get a little bit more out of the idiot. So, uh, no offense to the idiots, I guess. So, um, uh, the, uh, the attacking scenarios are, uh, the worst case scenario is my computer is on and unlocked and they've taken it. Uh, so, uh, it should really never be unlocked, but I have, uh, I have, especially when I'm in a uh, coffee shop or something like that, I don't usually use this stuff when I'm at work because I'm, I don't expect someone's going to run away with my computer. But um, I, I don't want my computer to be on unless anywhere but near me. Because when it's on, it's unencrypted. And that's bad. So I use, um, I wrote a script, just a bash script, that checks to see, every five seconds, checks to see if I'm connected to Wi-Fi. And then it records what Wi-Fi I'm connected to when I run the script. Um, checks five seconds later to see if I'm connected to Wi-Fi. If I'm not connected, it waits one minute and checks to see if I'm connected again. If it isn't, if I'm not, then it turns my computer off. I also wrote a UDEV rule that when you unplug the power cord from my computer, it just turns off. I also wrote a um, PAM module so that if you attempt a really dumb password into my lock screen, it'll turn off. So if you type in the word the password, password into my lock screen, it'll turn off. I never misspell my password that much. The, uh, the idea is, if someone gets my computer and has no idea what they're doing, the stuff that they do to, do to it, trying to figure things out, should have repercussions. Um, Int80 in his talk um, uh, goes into some of that stuff, uh, goes into some of it. Some of it was, um, one of the things that he had was, he, uh, like me, would keep his uh, boot partition on a USB drive, the MVR on the boot, uh, USB drive, which means his MBR on his laptop wasn't doing anything, so he wrote some assembly that would uh, overwrite his entire hard drive with, um, I don't know, some lead speak joke, I think. So if you turn his computer on without the USB drive in it, it goes to the first hard drive, which the MBR is just bytecode to destroy the, the rest of the hard drive, uh, which is sweet if you really want to protect your, if you think that someone might have the potential to unencrypt your hard drive. I don't have that bad of enemies. Um, and I also forget to put my USB drive in my computer when I turn it on, so I'm unwilling to do that. But I still have that idea. So I've installed the MBR to my USB drive. Um, also, the USB drive, the boot directory is encrypted uh, because I found out I can do that. Inside of the boot directory is a file that is the key file to my root partition of this. So the unencrypted boot partition decrypts my root partition in this. Um, there's no password for my root partition on my computer, so if I don't have this, I can't open my computer. If an attacker doesn't have this, he can't open my computer. And the key file is like 256 bytes or something like that, so it's better than any password I would make. Um, so that gives me two-factor encryption, so to speak. You need the USB drive and the password to unencrypt the USB drive to unencrypt my computer. Um, I have a, you back up the, you make a second key file, of course, encrypt that and back it up on a, public, on a server that you can get to in worst case scenario. In case this gets stolen or something, then you can pull it down from a live distribution. 
Are you guys with me? Okay, I feel like I'm talking really fast. Um, so since all that stuff is here, um, and also since most of my, most computers come with Windows by default, and I usually I never use Windows, I decided to use Windows to backdoor my computer. So on the first partition, you know, Windows is on there, MBR will boot uh, Windows, right? So when you get your computer, just shrink the Windows partition and put uh, the next partition is your root partition for Linux, your boot directory is in your pocket. Um, the Linux partition is exit, which Windows doesn't even recognize. So when you turn your computer on, the computer goes to MBR. The MBR doesn't have grub to it. It just has Windows MBR, boots Windows, everything's normal. So if you take my laptop and the screen's locked and you try and open it with password, it'll turn off. If you turn it back on, it'll turn on in Windows. And Windows is all backdoored. So it'll call back home and give me a remote access, and then I can take pictures through the webcam, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, this computer sadly didn't come with Windows, which is a terrible thing to say. It came with Ubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't want to pay money to make a backdoored Windows, so I, I just backdoored Ubuntu, and it's a lot. I get to get SSH in Ubuntu, like I get, I like Ubuntu a lot more than Windows, so it's nice to have that shell instead of CMD. Um, so um, I left a uh, text file, or actually a, 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 win, uh, a doc file on the desktop that said something along the lines of, uh, here's your new computer grandma, I tried to clean everything off for you. If you have any trouble, you can call me here. So that if someone innocent actually just finds my computer somewhere and turns it on trying to find, someone nice finds my computer and wants to do a good deed, they're capable of doing so and I don't call the police on them. Um, but someone that uh, is, has, does have malicious intent, I do not want them to burn my computer down and put their own operating system on it. I want them to keep the malicious operating system that's already on it. So I make everything welcoming for them. I include um, uh, the password, in case you need it, Grandma, is Marshall, the name of your first dog, or something like that. Um, just like everything that you would want in a new computer, I have it there. I even talk up Ubuntu a little bit to Grandma in hopes that the attacker... Um, so now I just need to get my computer stolen and we'll see if it works. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I put a great deal of work into should my computer get stolen and no one has yet, it stinks. Um, so uh, this is my to-do list. The, some of this stuff is, I made these slides a little bit ago, and because I used Arch, because I had to install Arch recently, I had to figure out some of this stuff anyway, so some of this is finished, like two-factor crypto, and um, the false password system for PAM is just a PAM module. It's, a, it's also on my GitHub. Um, I would like my, the Ubuntu operating system to extend the partition to cover my real operating system, so it looks like just one giant operating system. I have uh, a UDEV rule in Ubuntu that I found on the U uh, Ubuntu forums on how to hide the uh, existence of the other partition. Uh, because I don't want it to, if someone knows a little, I want it to look, I know I'm not gonna trick the NSA or somebody like that. I hope I, hope I never make them mad. But I know if, if someone knows what they're doing, they're gonna be like, oh, that's neat, they have a fake operating system. You know. So I don't want to, um, uh, I still want to get uh, as many people as I can. I still want to get my laptop back. So if someone happens to know a little bit about Linux partitioning, then I still want to hide it from them as much as possible. So the UDEV rule hopefully will cover a little more of that. Um, uh, that's uh, my information. You can email me. Uh, it's my GitHub, and I'm a, I write blog posts for Hurricane Lab sometimes. Uh, some of them, I think at least half of them are about breaking into people's computers at work. Uh, so uh, that's my presentation. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I should ask that first before I got the applause. Everybody's good? No comments or anything? You got any suggestions? Because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. All right, thank you. All right. Ready to? Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem at all. Uh, <laughs> back to
Yeah, yeah. Was, I, when you handed it, I was thinking I want to learn bad USB so bad. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. All right. Um, so that's it, really. I don't have anything to to say to to everybody else anymore. Um, besides, Cleveland unfortunately sold out. So sorry, I guess. <laughs> And uh, we'll see you all either at the community night, the last Tuesday of this month. And remember that next month is Lightning Talks. So if you'd like to present a 5 to 10 minute topic, um, email us or tweet at us or anything. And uh, spread the word. Thanks for, thanks for coming. And see you all next time.